Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the sixth episode of the Back to School 2020 series. Tonight, we're going to be featuring some perspectives from school board members that are working to make some critical decisions within their districts. Driving the conversation, we have Dr. Maria Armstrong, who is Executive Director for the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. And joining alongside her, we have Dr. Atiba Wiza, who is the Executive Director for the National Alliance for Black School Educators. Don't forget, if you like what you hear tonight and want to learn more, feel free to tune in every Thursday at 7 p.m. or subscribe below. We hope you enjoy. Thanks, Francois, for that introduction. And it's good to be back. We are winding down our back to school series as schools start to transition from some, at least, from remote to face to face. And some are still hanging uh, remotely. But uh, tonight, my co-host Atiba and I get to talk to school board members. Atiba, do you want to do the intros? Yes, why not? Our guest this evening is Ms. Patricia McNeil, first year um, school, trust school board member in the Hempstead Union Free School District, Hempstead, New York. Hempstead is a suburb of New York City, about five to 10 miles from the um, Queens, New York City border. So it's um, strategically located in the western part of the county. And Ms. McNeil, a trustee as they're called there, I'd like to thank you very much for having agreed to come on to speak with us about some of the challenges which your district is facing and how you are addressing those challenges organizationally. And for you as a first time board member, this might be baptism by fire coming in, having to deal with COVID. <laughs> so perhaps you can tell us some of what that means and how you are dealing with that on a personal level. But before we begin, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Why are you opted to become a school board member? And what are you looking to accomplish as a member of your board of education? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Patricia McNeil. I've been a Hempstead resident for about 37 years. I volunteered in the school district for approximately 16 years in various positions. And I decided to become a board member because um, I want to make a difference. Most of us get on here to make a difference. My community needs help. It needs a different set of eyes. School is becoming more of a business than just uh, education. So I have a business background and I feel that can help with the budget and other aspects. Now, what I've been facing since this pandemic has is, is been large, larger than large, because we were behind before the pandemic came as far as technology. So trying to play catch up is three times as hard. We're a poor district. We, we rely about 62% on state aid. So it's, it, it's hard, especially with the 20% cut from the governor. That doesn't help. All of our students do not have uh, devices, even with money. We don't have the money. And once you get the money, you can't get the devices because everyone else has their bidding for the devices. So it's a complex situation. And even once we get the devices, they don't have internet service. So we have to find a way to provide the internet service and the devices. It's hard. There's a debate in the state capital about uh, having a blue ribbon panel to make sure that every community has access to broadband, particularly poor communities and rural communities. Some are pushing back against that. Will that help your district any if that bill were to pass, was to pass and the governor signs it into um, legislation so that broadband can be, become universal, if you will, in the state of New York? That bill would help us tremendously, not only within the schools, just within the community, because we have lots of residents who do not have access to internet. Even myself, I have files and I pay top dollar for my internet. And normally with Zoom meetings, I get kicked off two, three, four times before the meeting's complete. So we need better service. And yes, it would trem tremendously help us. Before we get rolling too far down the road here, Atiba, you know, I need to do our- um, Disclaimer. Our little disclaimer, <laughs> along with, you know, the, the, the purpose. I'm sure Patricia wants to know, well, why do you have me on this podcast? <laughs> and, and, you know, we're really looking at the, being able to talk about the topics that are centered around education, the, what's happening now. And so the opinions and the experiences that are shared here are not necessarily those of NABSI or ALAS. And it's just a conversation because people want to know. They want to know from various um, perspectives how things are being dealt with and why, more importantly, why. Then they start asking about, well, how are they going to, you know, going to implement what they say they're going to do? So I'm, I'm curious. Um, you said, you know, it's, a, it's a, a community that was behind in technology to begin with, right? 
Yes. And uh, 62% of the funding was uh, heavily re- relied upon by the state funds, right? Yes. So what was the driving force or area of focus that the funds predominantly went to that would not have focused on the instructional materials for students? With the pandemic, what we had to uh, focus on was the buildings. All our buildings are old. They are not technology friendly. So trying to get service throughout the building, trying to get the buildings brought up to par as far as the the ventilation systems. There's no way we can retrofit our ventilation systems for the type of filter that the governor would like us to have. So that's been uh, a lot of pushback from the support staff, the educators, and the parents, because they're not understanding that the guidelines are just that, they're guidelines. And we're not going to meet every guideline. We're not going to be able to check off every guideline on the list. We will do the best that we can, and even more so. We'll keep trying, but we cannot check off each and every one, but they want to hold our feet to the fire, and that's hard, impossible. Yeah. What's your demographics like in your district? I think we're up to now 69% Latino and the balance African-American. And you said you're 62% reliant on state aid. So you are African-American, Latino, and poor. Yes, and needy. Now, you said you didn't have the records that technology needed to the parents. So how are you addressing this? I mean, are you going virtual, hybrid, not at all? No, we're hybrid. So we have students who learn from home who are being taught from home distant learning and others are coming into the school building. We're finding the students, they, they look forward to coming to the school building because they want to be around their friends. The separation has been a lot and socialization is part of education. So they want to get back into socializing, of course, with their friends. But the parents are, of course, upset and nervous and afraid, saying, well, I don't want my child to get ill. And we understand that. But the hardest thing is the parents will make a decision this week to go one way. And the next week, it's another way. And we cannot switch off just like that because it takes a lot of planning with the classrooms, the class sizes, the teachers, instructors, even inside the building is every other, you know, six feet apart. So we're using a lot of classroom space for far less students. We don't have the ability to switch off and on that simple. So we're asking the parents, which we've been asking all summer, think about it and think hard and let us know because we cannot switch you just like that. Yeah, there's um, districts across the nation that are putting restrictions when they want to change their mind. They're putting restrictions about when, you know, they can switch, like you said. Uh, They're pushing it out till January. They got to spend this entire first semester, you know, which is really October, November, December, and November, December is, you know, truncated because of the holidays. And so they're saying, we're going to hold off until January, and then we can take a look at at it again. So in this hybrid, you know, we've been talking a lot about the inequities and more importantly, how to address the issues to be equitable for students to be able to come back. What kinds of approaches did your district take a look at when asking parents if they wanted to send their child to school or if they wanted to uh, work or stay at home uh, remotely? Uh, Did you look at any kind of demographic or for example, like students with special needs, were they a part of a, of a first wave to come back or was it solely based on a parent's decision? It was solely based on parents' decision. Now with uh, special needs students, they're there four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We have them four days a week. Everyone else is twice a week and schools are closed down on Wednesday for deep cleaning. It's just a hard decision, but most of our parents are working parents. So they need to send their child to school because who could afford childcare? Well, who can childcare. take it off the Wednesday? Like, how did you even come up with, you know, the magic Wednesday? And who takes care of the kids then? We tried to cover all bases. Yeah. Wednesday was just in the middle. So we figured we have two days and we have a day off. We have two days and we have two days off to get it ready for the following week. It was just a number that was picked that was convenient. We cannot cover all bases. We try to. We really do because we even have. We're still serving lunch. We have a bus that goes around to different locations at certain times to feed lunch to the students, even the students who are at home. So we're trying to cover all bases, but as you know, we are limited. We are a school. We're not their family. We're not their parents. We're a school, educational facility. What are some of the bi- biggest complaints you're hearing or concerns expressed by parents at this time? And how are you guys addressing it? 
Well, parents, um, what are we going to do with our child on Wednesday? What do we do on Wednesday? And if my child is not feeling well, what happens then? Even if they're at home, how do they get the work to make up? How do they get help when they need help with their homework, help with their studies? They're looking for assistance. And we have, we have programs that we're trying to assign people to, assign TAs and other um, staff members to give assistance. So we're just, we're winging it, we're, we're going, we're dressing it as it comes along. It, it's not easy. We hear about some communities too where outsourcing, um, because you're right, it's an educational institution. And, you know, there's very heavily reliant on before and after school programs. Oftentimes you have like a six to six kind of model, right? Six in the morning to be able to drop off your kids and then pick them up by six o'clock in the evening when you're about ready to come home. And even in those types of programs that, that a lot of communities are so heavily reliant upon, do you find yourself utilizing um, or outsourcing other types of agencies to help fill those gaps? And we're going to come right back for that answer because... Okay. It's time for us to take a break. Thank you for joining us for segment one. Don't forget, if you want to stay in the loop as to what is going on in various districts across the U.S. as it relates to Back to School 2020, feel free to subscribe or tune in weekly at 7 p.m. every Thursday. Thank you for joining us.